Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. It is finally time for me to pack up my classics bookshelf behind me, which means our move from London to Yorkshire is happening, like it's imminent. This bookshelf was one of the very first things we were built in the flat, and when I mean we, I mean Ben. But I mean I did the book, I did the book part of the bookshelf. It's been the backdrop to my videos for five years, it's been the focal point of our living room, and I feel a bit I feel a bit emotional about it because this is actually the last thing that we have that I need to pack, really. It means we're actually leaving London, which I know sounds really silly because of course I want to leave, but I've loved living in London and I love to stay, but I also would love to live here and in York. Um, so yeah, it feels it's going to be, I think this is like the end of an era, really, and it's the end of a chapter and the beginning of a new one. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted a question. Um, there are a lot, so I haven't been able to do all of them, but what I have done is quite a few questions very similar, or there were some obviously repeated questions, and um, I've kind of blended them together. But I will obviously have to unpack all my books as well, and I'm not actually taking the bookshelves with me because we're going to get different ones, because I love these, but they're not quite right for books, I think. And so there will be a whole video on building a bookcase as well. So if you do have any more questions, let me know because there'll definitely be more kind of unpacking videos to come. I've tried to split the question up almost thematically. Um, so kind of more personal, moving related questions first and then questions about books. So I will do timestamps, please make use of them. Um, but for now, I'll show you what our bookshelves currently look like. The way the bookshelves are organised at the moment are by publisher and I guess by classic editions and also obviously by size. Because they are done by kind of classic editions, there is also a kind of, I guess, a colour theme to it. At the moment, the majority of my hardbacks are at the bottom. They used to be at the top, but then we had done Ben's Natural History Museum Lego there for a while. Um, so it's a bit of a gap. So I've got my folios at the top, which have always kind of mostly been there. At the moment, as the bookshelves look behind me, they are completely bare because obviously all of my trinkets have gone and I'm a person who loves the trinket. Like, take me to the knickknacks and I will buy everything. Um, and so all of my lovely things are gone um, to be ready to be moved, obviously. Um, but I'm really excited to get them out because the things on my bookshelf always mean a lot to me. They're always some of my most important pieces that I have and also just stuff that I think is, you know, aesthetically beautiful. One thing I really like about using it as like my booktube backdrop is because you get to see all the different eras of my bookshelves and also the things that I'm interested in, the things that are on my shelf. Um, I will insert a picture of when we first moved into the flat and decorated it because it looks so different to how we looked more recently. Um, and so it's gone through definitely a few stages of kind of aesthetic looks. Now I've done my introduction, I think it's time to start packing up the books. I've placed all the questions in my notes app, so I'll just kind of randomly go through them as we pack together and we can bond over this very stressful experience, to be honest with you. A lot of the questions I've got about moving and about why we're moving, why we're leaving London to go to Yorkshire, I answered in a bit more depth, well actually just talked through in a bit more depth for my last packing video, so I will put that in the description. One, because then you can see what my other bookshelf looked like. These books are even more dusty and also just covered in cat hair because the cats sit on them all the time and go behind me, often in meetings. It's always been the worst thing when I've been on a meeting there's like a cat climbing up um, the chair behind me. They like to be involved. They do like to be involved. Thank you, Ben. The only problem with packing is that we have a certain cat who is the most irritable cat and loves going in boxes. So Freya is somewhere behind them, just kind of staring at them, seeing if she can jump in. Also, Ben is here because Ben is gonna basically. I'm very worried that I'm gonna. This is gonna take me ages. So I might. There might be moments where I just pass the book to Ben. I answer a question and Ben puts it in. <laughs> so as I pack up my folios, the first question is why York, which, as I said, I kind of go into a little bit more detail in my old video. Um, but for those of you who don't know, because this is the thing with Bookshare, I guess I'm being on YouTube for like 12 years or more than 12 years. Um, people kind of join your channel at different times. And so I think quite a lot of people now only know me for London. Um, but Ben and I used to live in York. We went to university in York, so where we met. And it's just always been where we're like been the happiest, I think. And we've loved living in London. But I think now we need a bigger place. We both work from home. We just can't afford it in London. So we're moving back to, yeah, I think the place that we've always kind of considered home. I spent a lot of my childhood up north. So even if it wasn't Yorkshire, I always knew I'd return. I always thought I might live in Northumberland. Um, but then after going to university and falling in love with York, it's just always been the place I wanted to return to. So there's a family element as well as just where I think we're going to be the most happy and also have more money to spend as well, which will be really nice after living in London for seven years. I don't think you can actually see her, but we've got a little Freya here. So I'm just going to move the box so you can see her. 
there she is <laughs> this question was actually answered quite a lot which is will you ever move back to london and obviously you never know what is in store for you i think in life because we thought we would move to york way later i think we thought we'd move in our like late 30s potentially or 40s but now it's at the very beginning of our 30s you're gonna go in go on then go on <laughs> i knew you'd do that sooner and later i knew you would you haven't been on the camera a lot because you're shy. And like Sybil, Faye is like the shy cat. Let me move that over so you can see her. Wonderful. Hey, I know. Are you putting your scent on it? Well, it's coming with you. You're going to be moving with this box. Um, so no, I don't think we'll come back to London just because... I, actually, I just don't think we'll be able to afford to. Um, I think London for me was a once in a lifetime opportunity to live here. And um, it's been amazing, but I think for financial reasons, I can't see us coming back to London. And we can't move you again, can we? You're a Croydon born and bred girl, aren't you? You're going to be a northern cat. <laughs> How did you just get out of the box? I think I'm going to start with my black penguin classics. That nearly killed a cat. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I just nearly killed Freya. The next question is, what are my five favourite places in the UK? And obviously London, York, Oxford. I could live in Oxford. I've always loved it. I fell in love with it when I first went. I'm actually going to really miss being an easy reach of it. The same with Bath. Um, ben and I both nearly went to Bath Spa University. And so the way I think about my favourite places in the UK are like, they're always the places that I know I could live and love living there. I've already forgotten how many I said. York, London, Oxford, Bath. My fifth one would be Tynemouth, which is in Newcastle upon Tyne. It's where my family are from, or part of my family are from. My dad's Geordie, and I spent all my childhood basically going there. And I have a video actually of um, when I had a holiday in there to Tynemouth, and going to Tynemouth is just going to be. I'm really happy we're going to be up close to Newcastle again by train and spend time there and spend time with my family. And I will definitely be having holidays to Tynemouth because. Yeah, it's one of my favourite places in the world. I love how I'm actually just standing and talking, not actually packing. It's going to take me ages if I do it like this. What is something you love about London and York which you feel to be underrated? I think for me it's just walking. Like, I think with any tourist city, there's always an emphasis on, like, the stuff you have to do rather than just be. Um, and I think living in a city is just... The lovely thing is just being, existing in that city. So I think for me it would be, like... Um, the kind of the green squares in London and the parks. In York, it would actually be a walk up the river, across like Millennium Bridge and then past Roundtree's Park. Just that walk with these beautiful houses on either side and the trees and it's just stunning. It's also quiet. It's somewhere that, you know, locals cycle up and down, you know, locals walk their dog there. It's not touristy. Um, and so it can just be a really quiet place to escape to. But Ben and I used to live like right next to it and we used to go all the time and we're going to be doing that probably like every evening when we move back. What will you miss most about London and what activities are still left on your bucket list? I'll have to ask Ben in terms of what activities. What activities in London are like, what, what's left on our bucket list? What haven't we done that we said we were going to do? Because I now can't remember. We, we were going to go back to Greenwich, which actually answers another question, which is our favourite place in London. I'd say it's probably Greenwich for both of us. It's also where I actually fell in love with Ben um, when we were first probably dating before we moved here. Um, we had a nice weekend, but what else was on our actual bucket list that was like the things to the museums, the things to go to? There were a couple of houses. Yeah, yeah there was... were quite a few historic houses, but I think we've just. We've, we're at peace now, aren't we? That we haven't been able to do everything because we can come back. There are quite a lot of questions about my favourite bookshops in London and or like which bookshop I would bring from London to York. And I feel like Kirkdale Books I really miss, um, which is in South London. We like South Kensington Books, Gower Street, Hatchards. In my mind, still want to say Persephone, even though that has now been in Bath for quite a few years, but I really love that bookshop and I wish that we would... I wish that we could have one in York as well. Unsurprisingly, I got a lot of questions about my favourite places in London and the places I'd recommend if you are coming to London. I would recommend Greenwich. Greenwich is, yeah, I think I said that earlier. I've already forgotten what I can say, but Greenwich is my favourite place. And I always think if you are coming to a city, sometimes because it's slightly further away or it feels a bit further away, it's not obviously far at all. Um, it can feel like maybe a bit of a trek or a day out because it's not central London, but it is so worth you just traveling that you know five extra minutes um to get on the dlr to go and visit greenwich and it's beautiful and it's got a market it's got bookshops and 
Um, I just love the architecture and the park is beautiful as well. Of course I'll miss places like Bloomsbury and um, kind of Shoreditch and Spitterfields which I've shared a lot on my channel before. Um, but I'll also miss Clapham. And um, Ben and I have lived in Croydon five years. We were in Peckham beforehand, so always kind of South London. We probably won't have a need to come back to Croydon. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, kind of emotional because this is where we made our first home together. Um, we obviously lived together at Ben's parents before we moved here, but this has just been such a monumental place. So along with Greenwich, I'll also miss Croydon. Can you test if this is too heavy? Because I'm really worried that they won't be able to pick it up. But I'm aware that's just because I'm really weak and I struggle. It's really heavy. Oh, that's fine. Are you sure? Oh God, yeah. I'm so weak. <laughs> Next question is, let me find one favorite, uh, most memorable bookish memories you made in London. I think, I mean, my job, my job is publishing. I got my, um, job because I moved to London that is like the ultimate bookish memory I guess working at HarperCollins you know going in and seeing all the books that they've published and just realizing that you work there um, and then obviously then getting my job at um, Bolded and going to kind of big publishing awards and things and winning the awards um, in terms of myself I think you know my friends coming down Ariel coming you know when Ariel came down to London I was you know I was kind of like her London residence and we have had so many lovely memories together book shopping together and just yeah spending time um I also just think kind of being in Bloomsbury and just living you know inside Mrs Dalloway and my entire life is so bookish I think that London for me is just so in intertwined with my bookish identity so there are probably too many to mention there's a question about what you do for a living and I think you probably explain it best because I always get it wrong do you want to just tell people what you do and if you enjoy it Okay, um, so... Yeah, I'm, Decapitated I I to, head, what? Well, I, I think you're to fine. The camera or speak to your you little microphone. You can speak microphone. to me if you want. Okay, hello. <laughs> I work... I work at a business management consultancy um, doing, like, working as an analyst on leadership training and for... Is, and is it your passion, Ben? No. <laughs> Goodbye. Do you want to actually you know what the next question is? Yeah. I had someone ask me, what's your best relationship advice? So I don't know why I'm laughing. It's a genuine question, but it's just funny because I took the mickey. I do. I obviously, I'm, you know, Ben works really hard. It's just, I think Ben is, you're happy when I think you come home, mm. you finish work. So come home, he actually works at home, but with me. But you do your Warhammer, you play your D&D. &D, that's, your, that's your passion. You're not necessarily yeah. like a career guy, are you really? So yeah, the relationship question is the best relationship advice now that you've been happily married for a while. Uh, communicate, just ah, talk. I do that. I do that a lot. <laughs> I yeah. Is that is that communication yeah. is key? Yeah. I think you're right. It is communication actually? I think it's like how you communicate. Mm -hmm. Like I communicate very very differently to Ben, but I think it's like knowing how the other person communicates and like knowing what's best for them as well, mm -hmm. and like understanding how they respond to stuff. I also think you just have to like the person. Like I love you but I also just really like you as you know yeah. as a human I find you really interesting and I think you have to really respect them but I think we obviously we we were never really friends we didn't really know each other before we dated no, not but really. I think we are like best friends it sounds really cheesy but like you are my mm. best friend <laughs> along with like you know all my other friends it's not like you're my you know your partner's your only friend but I think I think you have to be friends with someone and find what they're interested in interesting and I think we've always been very interested in different things but have kind of been like um interested in each other i guess yeah would you like to say for a few more questions oh then so there is one about your favorite book ben my favorite book yeah okay um so that's easy my favorite book is a book called iron council by china mievo um and yeah it's about trains and revolution and two of your um, favorite things yeah and it's just incredibly well written so, yeah, I'd really strongly recommend it. What is one book you love that Ben hates and kind of vice versa? For me, the only thing I could think of was the fact that Ben hates Dickens with a passion. And I like Dickens. I haven't read enough of Dickens to make my true... Like, I, don't, I couldn't say I have a favourite Dickens because I haven't read enough to make that. But Ben just genuinely, gen, genuinely and generally hates Dickens. Charles Dickens can go to hell. I mean, he, well, I was going to say, I was about to say he has, actually. <laughs> that is, that, that's actually to be confirmed. Um, yeah, you just, what is it about Charles Dickens, genuinely, for his writing that you don't like? You don't like Great Expectations. Was that the one that did it to you? I mean, I had to do Great Expectations from a GCSE English, which absolutely killed it for me. And mm. then just every time I've picked it up, I just find it very 
stodgy. Yeah, I think the thing is, I actually think Dickens, from what I have read, is a writer who just isn't stodgy, which is really interesting. I think it's really funny. Um, mm. Actually, if any of you have read a Dickens that you think Ben would like and find me, please recommend it. Because I that won't could read be. It. No, but you could try. We could both try together. Okay, but you remember, you're forgetting I've got this thing where the more someone recommends oh, something to me, the less I want to engage with That's it. That's true, which is kind of like me. The next one about me, I don't actually know because I've never read a single book that you've read. The only book we've shared is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Okay. Um, you've read Mrs. Dalloway. Yeah. Um, I guess. I mean, you like The Great Gatsby, don't you? I'm just trying to think of the books we, we studied together at university. The only one I can maybe think of is I don't... I When I first read Frankenstein, I didn't like it, and then I studied mm. it so many times. But I actually think... You think I'd love Frankenstein. I think, I think I'd you like, would like Frankenstein. Yeah, me too. So I think I need to go back and read Frankenstein. So mm. that would be the only one that I feel like we have... I have difference between. Freya. <laughs> Freya's just jumped in all the boxes. <laughs> the next question to it is, how do you think moving to Yorkshire will affect your reading choices? Moving from wolf country to Bronte country, and I love this question because I always read often based on location. Um, I mean, I actually read all of Virginia Woolf's works when I was in York because I was at university, and I also read all of Bronte's, I mean, when I was a lot younger, actually, um, but also when I was studying because I was going to write my dissertation on Charlotte Bronte. I love reading books where they're set, so I fully intend to reread all of the Bontes and do videos about the Bontes, do videos about going to um, Haworth and going to Scarborough and just going to different locations linked to the books and their lives because we'll be close to it. I wasn't really able to do it when we, I was first at university in York because we didn't have a car and it was slightly limiting. Um, so I definitely think that now we have a car we'll be going to a lot more Yorkshire locations and therefore I'll be reading them. We're also obviously going to be closer kind of closer to Manchester and so I'm going to whip out my um, Elizabeth Gaskell again so I definitely think there'll be more locations but because Wolf for me obviously Mrs Dalloway has always been linked to London but I read Mrs Dalloway and fell in love with Mrs Dalloway obviously way before I came to London. One thing that I think will really happen um, is that because I'm going to be back in a university city and with access to a university, in fact two university libraries but definitely York St John where I did my undergrad, I'm going to have access to just so much literary criticism again and so many kind of like books of critical essays in and I think I might do more analytical videos when I move just because I'll have access to the university resources again that I haven't really since I left and so I think it will change my reading because I think I might start reading and analysing a little bit more like I used to pretending I'm a student um, as well as kind of just reading the books that I've always loved. I actually also recently read the first book in the series by James Herriot, All Creatures Great and Small, which is obviously set in Yorkshire, and the experience of being on a Yorkshire farm, and I loved it, and it was a TV series that me and my mum were just, I grew up watching with her, and it's, I think, actually, it's probably her favourite books of all time, of the All Creatures Great and Small series, um, and because of that, I think I'll definitely read a lot more just general Yorkshire fiction, and kind of Yorkshire um, landscape and um, nature writing as well because I'll literally be in the area. I'm obviously going to have to pace myself though because and like I'll move to London, in fact this also answers another question, I've just done too many cloth bag classics, I might have to stop and get some lighter books. And like us living in London which always had a slight time limit on it anyway because of how much we would be able to afford in terms of space, I think this, we might just live in York. It kind of scares me because I've always moved that the idea of being in one place forever just feels quite daunting even though when I think about where I want to live ever, it's York. Um, so potentially I could be in York until I'm a little old lady, which I'm very happy about. Um, but it does mean that I've got a lot of time to read Yorkshire. Whoa, I'm scared. It does mean I've potentially got a lifetime to read books set in Yorkshire. Um, even though when I moved to London, I said I was going to read Dickens, and um, especially like Bleak House, it was like the book I had to read. I made wanted myself to read before I left London. Have I read a single Dickens novel while I've been living here? No. Um, and it's, it's really annoyed me, but I've just stopped beating myself up about it. In fact, Bleak House is literally here. I bought this um, with Ariel when we went to the Dickens Museum, which was really great. Have I read it? No. Will I read it? I hope so, otherwise I'm going to be... This for me is like the book I have to read before I die. Um, I think I'll absolutely love it. And I know so many of you have also told me I'd love it, but... That something happened and I just never read, I just never read more Dickens. I did Dickens at university, but not a lot because I then basically did 18th century studies. And in fact, that leads me on to another question about university, so I'll let me get my questions. So the first question is, what did I do my thesis on? So for my undergraduate, I did a thesis on Virginia Woolf and it was called, um, it had a bit of a wanky title, it was 
Virginia Woolf, queer futurity, the impossibility of future. And the in bit of, poss of impossibility was in brackets because it was like impossibility, possibility. Um, and it was on Mrs. Dalloway, uh, To the Lighthouse and The Waves. And it was all about the idea of reproductive futurism and queer identities. And yeah, I, I loved it. it. It started off as a like an essay on like time and space and then very quickly became um, an essay about queerness in her writing, um, which is very typical of me, I have to say. Then for my MA at University of York, I didn't have a great experience, if I'm honest, mainly because I did MA in English Literary Studies, which is an open pathway MA. I did one, one Victoria Literature class, I think, and I did the rest 18th century studies, and my lecturer, um, basically, or the person that was kind of like a tutor or something, said, like, do you want to swap over for 18th century? Um, because I was basically doing all 18th century, and I said no. And the reason I said no was because I wanted to write the dissertation that I ended up writing. But I really wish I did, because it meant I left with an MA that didn't feel representative of like what I'd actually studied. So now when people ask me what I did for my MA, I say I did an 18th century um, literature and culture, just because I feel like that's... I don't know why I didn't change it. But basically, the dissertation that I did was actually a dissertation I decided on doing during my undergrad at Oxford John, when I studied 19th century literature. So my original idea for my dissertation was actually on women writing about the Chartist movement. So 19th century women and female writers perspectives on trade unionism and strike action and yeah, Chartism. And I wanted to do it on Charlotte Bronte Shirley and Elizabeth Gaskell's Mary Barton and North and South. I then went to my tutor and they basically was like, I think you need a man in there. And to this day, I'm just going to say, you never need to feature a male writer. It would have been fine for me to do a female perspective on trade unionism. Um, so I'm still angry about that and it's been years. I wanted to do it from a northern perspective, but they suggested that I also included like a southern perspective, so like a London perspective. So they basically told me, and I don't think I was strong enough um, to say no, um, or to pick a different novel. Um, so they basically told me to write it on um, Old and Lock by Charles Kingsley, which is a novel I hate. and. I don't find interesting at all. Um, and so I hated my dissertation, um, apart from the bits on Elizabeth Gaskell. And I never talk about the fact that I did my dissertation for my MA on Elizabeth Gaskell. She's one of my favourite writers and I don't talk about her enough, so I would definitely try and make an effort once I'm up north. I actually ended up writing on the idea of careworn men, which actually, careworn is a really interesting um, descriptor that actually Elizabeth Gaskell uses a lot. And also the way she uses the word careworn changes throughout the novel and actually moves from actually just being linked to the trade unionists to being linked to kind of the owners of the mills. It's just really fascinating. Um, but I ended up doing it on working class heroes, so a, more of a male perspective really, looking at working class heroes in, in Victorian social novels. And Victorian social novels are like one of my favourite things about literature anyway. And it's again something I just don't talk about on my channel, which is really interesting. I think because I really just did so much 18th century during that degree, I've kind of forgotten that I spent the majority of it writing on Victorian social novels, so please let me know if you'd be interested to hear more because I'll definitely be able to crack open my old essays for that one. Another question I got asked a lot was whether I'm going to go back to university, and I'm going to be honest with you, I was actually kind of due to go back to university in September, so I was actually going to put myself forward to do an MA in history, and unfortunately because of the cost of this move and also the fact that the house that we're moving to is a bit of a do-it-upper in some aspects it has damp like rising damp it's got lots of just yeah damp issues it's got to have a whole damp proof course um I can't afford it anymore like all my, my savings have had to go on that which has kind of actually been it's such a privileged thing to be able to do to save up to do it anyway just kind of for fun um but yeah so a bit heartbreaking but obviously the good thing is we're getting a house in York which is really exciting um and in fact you know what I'm going to plug my coffee account if you would like to support our damp proof course if you would like to tip my channel um, and help me um, find the funds to do our damp work please donate not donate I'm not a charity please tip me if you enjoy my videos because it will actually be quite useful to be honest but yes I wanted to go back and actually study history because that was actually the degree I wanted to do originally I kind of changed my mind quite last minute really and decided doing literature I wanted to do history um, since I was a little girl and then I just ended up doing literature and I'm really glad about it and all literature for me I've always had a history context to whatever essay I've written it's the reason I love classics is because I love history really um, but I wanted to go back and do it so one day maybe I will do an MA in history um, which 
yeah, so, but I don't, not now. But you know, if I get my damp proof courses done, then maybe one day. A lot of people also asked if I'd ever do a PhD. And I used to really want to do one when I was a little girl. I was obsessed with doing a PhD when I was like 11. I don't think so now just because it's such an intense period of study. Um, and I, I just don't know what's going to happen in my career. Like, I don't really know what's in store for me. Maybe I will do one day. I always thought I'd go into education, um, not into publishing. And so life has just never gone to plan in the most wonderful way. Because I know what will happen. I'll say I'm never doing a PhD. And then like five years later, I'll be doing a PhD. Um, but yeah, it's not... It's not on my current life plan. The next question is, how did you get into publishing? And I kind of got into publishing through this, to be honest. Um, I started making videos in on this channel in 2012. And I, because of that, started to work with publishers and just kind of um, do a few sponsored things a long time ago. I don't do that anymore because I don't like the pressure. Um, but also just, you know, getting proofs, getting to know the PR assistants and things, and then being invited to events. And then because I had this, like... Um, I could show almost that I could build an online community. It was really useful when I first joined publishing. Obviously, it's still useful now, um, but obviously it was, you know, now it would be things like, you know, BookTok and Bookstagram, uh, whereas at the time, BookTube was still kind of quite new, I think, to the industry, and the industry wasn't really using it. So my experience making videos actually led to me getting an internship at HarperCollins. Um, I also was a bookseller before that, um, and when I went to my interview, actually, for my internship, the only thing they were interested in was, didn't mind about my degree, didn't care about my degree at all. It was, what was it like being a bookseller? What did I learn from being a bookseller? And what about my kind of online community? So when people ask me for tips, I always think bookselling is such a brilliant one because it shows you have so much experience of like what readers want and what they're looking for and what appeals to them and also just the, the changing landscape of kind of commercial fiction often as well. I'm also now at the point in my career where I'm interviewing people and reading a lot of CVs and hiring people and I think the thing that comes up quite a lot in people's CVs and cover letters is that they're kind of telling me not showing me. So with if you have like an online presence if you want to get in marketing which is what I am I'm the head of marketing, by the way, at Bolger Books, which is an independent publishing company. It publishes commercial fiction globally. Um, but for me, it's like my YouTube channel was evidence that I love books. Everybody, when they write their CV, says I've had, you know, a love of books since I was a little child. And so does kind of everybody in publishing. So you kind of need to show me evidence of that. What have you done? What, you know, wh how have you taken your skills, interests and made it a thing, like done something with it? whether it's volunteering or having a book talk page or whatever, a book talk page, a book talk channel account. Oh, I'm so old. So that's how I got into publishing and also like always my top tips for people who kind of want advice on how to get into publishing because it is really competitive. But I think kind of showing, not telling definitely kind of helps you stand out a little bit when we're looking at CVs. I'm actually starting to feel really sad. That looks really empty. It's definitely the end of an era. Even for, if you've watched my channel, when I've been in this for that, I've been in here five years, this for you also must feel like the end of an era because this means, in fact, this means this is my last video in this flat. It's, that for me is just, I'm definitely gonna have a cry as soon as I turn off the camera. I'm gonna have like a 10 minute cry, I think. Let's do some book questions, shall we? Um, a favorite book outside of Jane Austen. This is really funny because I can always tell when people, you know how people join your channel in waves and I've had a massive like Jane Austen fixation recently. And so there've been a lot of videos about Jane Austen. And I know that so many of you will know instantly that my favourite book is Mrs. Dalloway or one of my favourite books is Mrs. Dalloway. Um, so I find it interesting that like that, yeah, obviously, isn't, of course it's not obvious to everyone. Like it sounds so, um, so big headed that everybody should know because of course you shouldn't know. But my favourite book outside Jane Austen is Mrs. Dalloway and To the Lighthouse, The Waves. Um, I love Rebecca, I love Elizabeth Gaskell, I love North and South. I love Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Um, the Great Gatsby, um, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights is definitely one of my favourite books, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates, looking at the books even though half of them are now in a box and I can't rely on them. I can see Thomas Hardy down there with Tessa Durbel's A Vast Man in Crowd, Ian Forster is one of my favourite writers, Howard's End has been, yeah, one of my top, like, top books of all time. What I will do when we're all settled in New York and I have new bookshelves and I put all the books on the shelves, um, I will do my favourite classics or my favourite books, like a video specifically on that because even though I've mentioned them, I've done videos like that on my channel before, it's like years ago, so I'll do another one. Favourite classic to recommend for beginners? I always say Pride and Prejudice. Not only is it a brilliant book, it's just really accessible and it's really funny and it's really light-hearted as well as having all that 
you know, you can really analyse it as well. You can get really deep in it, but you can also just enjoy it for what it is, which is a romance book, but with just so much wit and humour to it. And it's so sharp. And the way she gets her characters, you know, her characterization is just spot on. And, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful book. And I feel like it's also just easy to read. And I think you get swept up. You know, you open the page of Project Prejudice and you know who the characters are. You know, you hear their voices. You know you are just going to settle in to the most wonderful book. Um, so that would be my recommendation if you haven't yet read any classics. There's a question on format here about paperback or hardback. Um, I prefer paperback for fiction and hardback for like history, history books, like non-fiction, mainly because I love the full colour picture pages, um, like big ones in history books. Um, but I much prefer reading on paperback, I just find it more comfortable. There's also a few questions about formats, whether I read on Kindle. Um, I actually really like reading on my Kindle, I don't do it that often, but I often do if I'm like wanting to really quickly read, read a classic. I read really fast on my Kindle, um, way faster than if I'm reading paperback, because for some reason I just focus on it. Um, but my favourite format to read in is actually audiobook. Like audiobooks and me are just so well suited to the way my brain works, which is very fast and I always have to do a million things at once and so an audiobook just really helps with that and I, and I always focus on it and I remember the books just as well as I've read them which I think is sometimes people's hesitation but I can confirm never been an issue. What are some of your favourite books that aren't a classic? Um, most of the books that I love I feel like will become classics like Jonathan Strange and Mr Noel by Susanna Clarke is a masterpiece. I love Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. It's probably one of the best like um, contemporary books I've read in a really long time. Another book I really love is The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton, which I'm definitely due a reread because I think I read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Noel and L The Luminaries around the same time when I was at university. And in fact, someone did ask me if I'm going to reread Jonathan Strange and Mr. Noel when I moved back to York, because it's set kind of partly in York. And 100%, I've been waiting to move back to read it. I'm really excited. There is a really lovely question about like associations with reading. So if there's any like scents or things that you've eaten, it's really now so connected to a book. And for me, this is a great question because I am so sensory and I love like the smell of things. Um, the Yankee Candle um, called Lemon Lavender reminds me of Outlander. Like whenever I smell it, and it's one of my favourite candles, I just go straight back to being in Scotland and reading Outlander. I think that was actually the holiday where I started Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell as well. Um, but yeah, we stayed in Scotland with um, our family friends and they just had this candle. And my mum and me then came home and like, both bought it because we were obsessed with it. I think it's probably still my mum's favourite one. But whenever I smell it, I'm just transported not only back to the, the Scottish Highlands where they live, but also to reading Outlander. And that's another, I guess, example of like, I love reading books where they're set as well. Um, and so I'm excited to do a few holidays up north and in Scotland as well, and read some more Scottish books, because I'll be that bit closer. Carolyn left so many great questions, but this has to be a personal favourite. If you were to create your own line of tea, what would you name it? And I came up with um, a Roy Boss of one's own, which I think, I mean, I would buy it. I love Roy Boss tea, and any Virginia Woolf reference, I'm down. How do you annotate your books? Do you annotate by theme, character, quotes, etc.? I annotate my books in like a specific way, I guess. So like when I was reading Emma and annotating Emma recently, I almost do it like I'm writing an essay. So I decided that I was like focusing on the idea of blunders and mis and misinterpreting your own feelings and also like how the how the novel kind of guides the reader down the wrong track and Emma down the wrong track and who is telling the truth and just the idea of like the plurality of truths and things. Um, and so I had this idea, almost like I had an idea from an essay in my head and then as I was annotating, I was almost annotating to look for specific things. So when I reread Emma, let's say I read Emma again and actually the questions I was interested in are marriage, my annotations would be very different. And that's why I like actually annotating books because every time I return to a book, I always pick a different theme. So yeah, I guess thematic is the answer. I do annotate it by theme. But normally it is because I've kind of got one theme in my head and then it's almost like a detective. It's like a mystery. It's a puzzle for me to solve to kind of get collect the clues and then kind of end with almost like a thesis, I guess, in my head. There are quite a few questions about history, which I just love to see. Um, and I think I'll do a few more videos on it, but um, there's one particular one, which is where did your love of history start and where did your love of the Tudor start? And brilliantly, I can literally show you in this video. So it's all down to one book. 
The Royal Line of Succession, The British Monarchy. And this is a book that basically my nan and granddad um, had. They must have bought it when they were like, I don't know, at like an English heritage place or something. And they just had it, you know, like when people go and they get little tour guides and things. They just had it on their bookshelf at the bottom. They didn't have many, many books really. And um, they weren't massive. Yeah, they didn't get, they didn't really have any books, but they had this. And as a little girl, I just was obsessed with it. And the funny thing about this book is that where the staples open is Elizabeth I um, with the Phoenix portrait, which were my favourites. The book just naturally opens here. I honestly think if it had fallen on the next page with the House of Stuart, it would have been the Stuarts, but it just so happened to open and I just became obsessed with it. And it's literally these pages and I used to look at it every single day. And so this is actually the, probably the most treasured possession I have because it's so rare, I think, to know exactly where the seed of something started that then just changed your entire life, as my love of history has done. A burning question that I know you're all dying to know is which is my favourite wife? Um, I have to say, it's still Anne Boleyn, and that's mainly because it's always been Anne Boleyn. Like, she was my, the wife that I fell in love with first, and even though I love every wife individually, you know, I have so much love and respect for Catherine of Aragon, and you know, for Catherine Parr, and you know, I love Catherine Howard, and you know, Anne of Cleve, all, all of them. I also just really hate like pitching them against each other because I think you can really like Anne Boleyn, but then still like be a supporter of Catherine of Aragon. The drama of it all is what really got me into history, and obviously with Elizabeth the First. So uh, it's yeah, it's still Anne Boleyn. What's the first book you remember reading as an adult? I think it probably is Philippa Gregory's um, Of a Bling Girl because I think I think I actually read The Bling Inheritance before The Of a Bling Girl. Um, but The Ever Blinger was like a big moment for me. It was my first adult historical fiction I've read. And then my first non-fiction was The Six Wives of Henry VIII um, by David Starkey. In terms of like the first book I remember reading, oh, I can't remember. It's definitely like a children's book. Um, in fact, another person asked me like what my favourite children's books are. So I guess this kind of answers it. I was a massive um, Jacqueline Wilson fan. I think anyone who is currently, like grew up to be a socialist was probably a big um, Jacqueline Wilson fan. I also, not to get too deep about it, I also... There were similarities in my own childhood um, with some of her books, and so I also found them relatable, which might seem a bit sad if you've read any Jacqueline Wilson books, but it's true. Um, I also loved the My Story books, which are these little kind of diaries that were all set in different time periods, and I loved those. Um, Harry McClary, um, Winnie the Witch, um, Brambley Hedge, I wish I could live in a Brambley Hedge book, um, and of course Paddington. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few that I've missed out, but they were my favourites growing up. Now we're on to my favourite book to movie adaptation or book to TV adaptation. Obviously it's 1995 Pride and Prejudice. Someone said, I had a few questions and like two people were like, please can you tell me what your favourite is outside of Pride and Prejudice, which shows I must have watched it quite a lot or talked about it quite a lot, I mean. Um, I love the North and South um, adaptation. It's one of my favourites um, with um, Richard Armitage. The Emma, I, I do like the latest Emma, but I really love the one with Romola Garay. Um, I think that's how you pronounce her name. The Test of Devils with Gemma Arterton. And also, controversially, The Wuthering Heights with Tom Hardy. Because even though it's very different from the book, I just think it gets, it gets a sense, it gets a soul of the book. And it was the adaptation I watched before watching, uh, sorry, before reading the book. And it just really struck a chord with me when I was like a young teenager. Watching adaptations was kind of like my gateway into actually reading the classics in the first place because I watched them and then was like, oh my goodness, this is the best thing ever, I have to read the books. But now I think I'm at a place where I don't, if I have the luxury of not knowing what happens. So for example, I've never seen Vanity Fair. I've never read Vanity Fair. I really want to. I would rather read the book um, and then watch it. A bit like Middlemarch. I hadn't seen the adaptation for that until I read it. And that was a really special way to then experience the book again. Um, so I do try and be a bit more... Well, I, I just am quite strict to myself now. What are your favourite films and favourite TV shows? TV shows, Downton Abbey. I'm a massive Downton Abbey fan. I actually met the flatmate that I had um, the most at university um, because we both lived Downton Abbey. That's how we bonded. It's actually how we got to know each other because we both had Downton Abbey-esque tumblers, um, which says a lot about when I went to university. I love the sound of music. We actually walked down the aisle to Edelweiss and we left to climb every mountain, which was really quiet so no one could hear, but I knew it was there. Um, and about time, um, I think it's also a really special film. This is such a lovely question, I wish I answered it earlier. If Paddington came to life and knocked on your door, how would you spend the day together? 
Like that is the best question. Um, I think me and me and Paddington would go to Fortnum and Masons. We'd have an afternoon tea. He would get completely covered in marmalade, and I'd have a million cups of tea, and it would be joyous. And then, yeah, we'd go book shopping together. Oh, if if I could have a day with Paddington Bear, my life would be complete. Um, that actually brings me so much joy. So yeah, me and Paddington would be at Fortnum's. Can you recommend a book for each season? Yes, I feel like for spring, Emma. But then also. Is Emma a summer book? Because of Box Hill, it might be. Um, let's say spring is Emma. Um, summer then might be Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, which is also one of her books because it feels like the claustrophobic heat of summer. Autumn has to be a novel by the Bronte sisters. I'm gonna say Wuthering Heights. I feel like Wuthering Heights is a book best enjoyed at the end of autumn, just when it is turning to winter. Um, and then winter, has to be an Agatha Christie now. Now I've discovered Agatha Christie, curling up in winter over Christmas with an Agatha Christie novel, now just cannot be, um, cannot be matched. Someone asked if there's anything we'd do differently about our wedding if we ever had to like repeat it. And I genuinely think no. The only thing as I said is that uh, we've really picked out our music for our wedding really carefully. Obviously it's a registry office wedding and you don't get, you don't get a huge amount of control in terms of like volume. And so we had some really like fun tunes from like Ben's favourite films and video games, um, especially that we knew his friends would like really recognise. And I, I, people could hear it, but it was quite quiet. Um, so we had like the Jurassic Park theme and I walked down to Edelweiss and we actually walked down together, which I really loved that we did that. Um, but I think on the way out, you literally just couldn't hear Climb Every Mountain. That'd be the only regret. For those of you who don't know, we were originally actually going to get married. Um, in 2020, and so we had to cancel it. The original wedding we planned in 2020 was actually like a bigger London ceremony and then a private like elopement basically to York. And after COVID, when we had to cancel it, we were like, the only thing we care about is our York wedding. And so we just canceled the London one. We truly had the most amazing small wedding. You know, people say that like getting married is like, the best day of their life. I never understood it until we had the best day of our life. While I've got this in my hand, I'll just show you, because I know so many of you will love this. This is my manuscript of Mrs. Dalloway from SP Books. Um, I bought it, I think, when I got, I got a job, I think. Something happened. I treated myself, this is like a gift to myself. Um, and it is a big book of the manuscript of Mrs. Dalloway with all of Virginia Woolf's kind of markings and where she's kind of writing, you know, cutting out characters, putting in characters, changing things. You've also got just like her little like, you know, just notes for herself, like some sums and stuff that she's done on the sides. And you can see when her inks went out and she had to change pen, like it was my favorite thing. Um, so this is really special. I think this is probably my most special book. Alongside my little pamphlet about the royal line of succession. These are the two things I'd probably like save in a fire. We're getting so close to the end now. I feel like emotional because the bottom shelf is completely empty. Um, a lot of the questions I had, I would definitely kind of make specific videos about. A lot of them were about, you know, what am I looking forward to doing in York? And hopefully, I mean, definitely, there'll be loads of videos of us in York um, because that's where we're going to be. As well as, I'm still coming back to London really regularly because of work. In fact, I'm coming back literally late April and then maybe twice again in May. Yeah, twice again in May. So I really won't have left. It won't feel like I've left at all. We're now at the very final books, which feels really sad. It looks really empty and I'm gonna really miss these shelves. They weren't they weren't the best bookshelves, but they were beautiful. And they were the first things in our flat. Who knew I could feel so emotional over bookshelves? I mean me, obviously. Of course it would be me. But yeah, I think this is it. We're done. Now we just gotta sell take them up and the next video that you see from me, I'll be in York. So thank you so much for watching um, all the videos that we've had, we shared together in this flat with this bookshelf. Thank you to the bookshelf for its service. Um, many, many videos of memories. And thank you if you, you asked a question for my Q&A. There are quite a lot left over, so I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, but I will save it and maybe do a different video about it or just answer them at a different time. But um, I'm not gonna lie, now I'm gonna turn off the camera and probably have a cry. <laughs> So um, I'm going to leave you because we, you definitely don't need to see that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for loving the videos we've done in London and for, oh, why am I crying? <laughs> Who knew this was going to happen? Thank you so much for 
the support maybe that you've given to my London videos or the love you've given to them. Obviously I'm still going to be back all the time so there'll definitely be more bookshopping videos in London but I really hope you love the videos we film in York and in Yorkshire as well because I'm really excited to share the city again with you because I know so many of you um, weren't with me when I was lived in York before so there's lots of videos that will feel really new to you. Please leave in a book emoji um, or a tear emoji. <laughs> Just someone crying. Um, but yeah, thank you very much and I'll see you again soon in another bookish video. And I promise I will not be on the edge of tears in that one because it would not be a pretty sight. But yeah, thank you for watching. This is it now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the last box.